Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome to Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck. Our guest today is Andy Comiskey. Andy's the founder of Living Waters Ministry, which ministers healing to the sexually and relationally broken, a ministry that's much needed in our culture today. Welcome, Andy. Thanks, Peter. So great to be yeah, here. It is really good to have you on the program. Yeah, and, happy uh, to be. Yeah. Let's, why don't we begin by just telling a little bit of your story, your own background. Okay, yeah. Well, you mentioned something about sexual and relational brokenness and wholeness. So... Obviously, I didn't get into this just because I'm a really nice person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but actually, because I was a very broken person and still to some degree am, but I'm so grateful to the wholeness that Jesus always invites me into. So I became a Christian while I was in the middle of homosexual identity, hanging out with other people who were similarly identified. And Jesus met me there through faithful Christians. And obviously, you know, we all have different ways in which we get attached to things that we shouldn't be attached to, but it was through the faithfulness of turned on Christians that I thought, you know what, this really isn't a great meal. Yeah. I mean, I'm free to eat it in, you know, overexposed Southern California, but I'm actually not becoming full or a better person because of my sort of sexual liberties. So Jesus brought a great freedom by calling me to himself and making himself known to me through an amazing group of believers. There were many challenges in letting go of things that I was addicted to and just the insecurity of if I'm not gay, then who am I? Yeah. I mean, that's a big thing. Yeah. At least it gives you a self and it gives you other selves with, with whom to belong. So... Jesus had to become the source of my identity, and his church had to become my community. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's not just Jesus, great guy in the sky. It's got to be grounded in where you live and where you worship, because it was where I lived that I was worshiping false things. And so to worship the real and the true, and so to become real and true, I had to become integrated in the community. Did you experience yourself at that time as disintegrated and then you were searching as a result or people came to you and yeah. began to reach out to you? How'd that happen? It was both. I mean, utterly both. Obviously, I wouldn't have been welcoming to anyone with an alternative point of view had I not had what I now see as a kind of holy discontent. I wasn't a Christian, but the Holy Spirit still works in us through people's yeah. prayers, whether we're, you know, on top of the spiritual game or not. And I think the Holy Spirit was creating a discontent, and that made me open to others who were winsome and real and alive to Christ and merciful to me, and that made a big difference. I mean, I believe Christians can be the bridge to people who are caught in all these sort of LGBT realities now. I mean, this was a long time ago for me. I was in LA. It was kind of hip to be gay on my campus and so on, but it wasn't in the greater culture. Now it's just become so mainstreamed, and I think Christians are intimidated. Yeah. And I just want to say, through my experience, Christians are the bridge, man. And we need to know that, right? <laughs> you know, just to insinuate yourself in people's lives 
knowing that however defensive they are, Jesus is still really the answer. I mean, he's the real deal. And only, only the meal of Jesus satisfies the deep cries of our hearts. Oh, it's so, absolutely true yeah. for everybody. Because that cry is in everybody. I know. Right? That's that need, that cry yeah. to search for identity. Absolutely. Because we live in a fallen world where people feel alienated yeah. uh, because of that. And the Father has sent the Son yeah. to bring us home and help us understand who we are. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of simple. It is simple. Like, I don't have like these great Freudian <laughs> insights that are going to change everything. <laughs> Only Jesus changes things right. if you're open and if if there are those kind of, I, I think for me, because of mistrust and a lot of projection that I wouldn't be able to, to, to be a good Christian. I wouldn't be able to be successful as a Christian because I was so fractured and so addicted, you know? So not a great formula for, you know, what you think is holiness, but the mercy of God is so much greater as far as forgiveness, as far as, well, you know, if you're falling into sexual sin, you know, three times a week, and then the next week you're, you only fell once. Awesome. That's Progress. great. You've done great. You know, so I think Christians that have that kind of mentality to come around you and to walk with you um, so that, in my case, to see that I'm making progress even if I'm not, of course, ultimately where, where it's best to be. Right. But I think God just meets us where we're at, and that was true for me, and I'm so grateful. So th those were watershed early moments of transition while I was a student. And then there's a deeper level of healing that I had to go through, and that's where we do need insightful caregivers and spirit-filled caregivers. I think it's a combination of of well-tuned, you know, finely tuned insight plus the power of the Holy Spirit. So I, I believe in the therapeutic process, but I believe the Holy Spirit can quicken that when you're in a supportive community and you're also willing to take the steps. And, and I was. So I think ultimately what I now understand to be chastity or integration, um, you know, the good melding of one's spiritual desire and the longing to be a good gift to other people, um, I think that's what was going on in all of that. And that can only be worked out with a merciful and insightful community. Yeah. So, And your, you, your transition, you're taking on a new identity. You're yeah. married now, right? You're yes, married I and you am. have children. And... Yes, I am. I am a married man. Yeah. It's harder to be married than it is to come out of homosexuality, Peter. It is. Just wanted you to know that. Yeah, I'm married too. I know, the, yeah. I know some of the challenges that are <laughs> I present. I know, but it's yeah. a great challenge. Yes. You know, it's like great, it's a great uh, challenge to offer yourself to someone over and over again that you totally love and yet who is so unlike you and so wonderful and so annoying. And I think that's the whole deal, isn't it? Yeah. Is that you're provoked to give beyond what you feel like you can. And I think for me, that was key. Like when I began to meet this woman that I so loved, I thought, this is the greatest girl. And then I thought, but am I really enough? Am I good enough gift for her? You know, can I, can I keep on delivering the goods, not just sexually, but emotionally, Will I just retreat into my old, isolating, narcissistic patterns? I think those are more human issues than ex-homosexual issues. But those were real fears that I had. And so, again, the community, again, the impetus of Jesus in his self-giving and in, in his good call and in his, the power of his spirit to keep giving the gift continuously. You know, I didn't, I hadn't learned that in the homosexual community because yeah. that's not a high value. It's like you can have a friend, but you can have lots of friends. Um, but to have one friend that you're committed to giving the gift, that to me was, I don't know if I can yeah. do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not just, it's not just men with same-sex attraction who ask that question. Absolutely. Human beings ask that question. Yes. Can I give myself to one person for yes. my whole life? Yes. And to and, be genuinely chaste. And I don't yeah. mean abstinent, of course. It's, I, I'm not abstinent with my wife. 
but I want to be ordered with her. Right. I, I want her to get the best that I have and for that not to be siphoned off in unreality. Yeah. And, and so I think that, that, is my, that, is, that is my privilege and, and it's my daily decision. And so I'm still walking out the chastity thing, man. <laughs> I mean, we're never done <laughs> yeah. until no, we see him true. face to face. No, absolutely true. So I'm into it. You know, and people say, well, are you really? Like you even said, like, you're married now. Like you have children. <laughs> I don't think you I said it just like that. You <laughs> did, you little cherub. And I'm like, I'm so not a cherub, but I'm faithful. Yeah. I'm very flawed and very faithful. Yeah. And I think that's good. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. You know, it's great. Become a better gift. Like so, always more. So out of that, out of your experience of transformation, healing, wholeness, yeah. integration, all that yes. comes living streams, comes the ministry, right? Living, living waters. waters, Desert yes. Stream Ministry, is it? It's desertstream.org ministry. Okay. And Living Waters, living waters. is yeah. this group that began back in LA, 1980. This group, my pastor said, hey, why don't you start gathering with other people like you? You're like two steps ahead. Why don't you invite them in? The Holy Spirit's moving. Create a safe place. You're a prayerful man. You're learning how to listen, learning how to pray. We were gaining a lot of insights through just good, inductive pastoral care. Like, oh God, oh God, oh God, what are we doing? This is helping. This isn't helping. And through this process, our church was in revival. Many people coming to know the Lord, needing so much help to even be able to become worshipers of Jesus continuously, you know, yeah. to actually say, I'm a Christian now. This defines me. Yeah. Um, uh, we started this group called Living Waters. And so that was, you know, many years ago. We've continued to refine it and grow it. In the midst of it all, I became a Catholic. So then Wonderful. all the great St. John Paul II, theology of the body, dovetailed with, with you know, the Christian's, truth that I knew as an evangelical, but he, he's the best. I mean, he is the best at, at the image of God and how that weaves into our spirituality and integration in the church. Theology of the body is the best. Yeah. And so that all became a part of Living Waters. And uh, yeah, so, so we- So you started in California. We did. But there's much more to it now. Tell us a little bit about what it looks like. Yes, well, it's, a, it's now, it's a pretty intensive, spirit-filled, Catholic-based, but ecumenical, so we welcome all Christians who are seeking chastity. And there's so many sins against chastity, certainly homosexual behavior and gender identity issues are only one expression, but, but all the wonderful traditional guys who can't stay off internet pornography or um, people who have been sexually abused or where there's been early trauma, where there are some, some real frustrations that they don't even understand as to why I am not free to be a gift and I don't want to be a gift. And yet, according to St. John Paul II, um, we are all called to be mature expressions of the gift. And that's just another beautiful way of saying we're all called to be integrated, chaste men and women, and to, to, to be free to appropriately offer ourselves in a way that engenders life in other people. Would you say that's the, the definition maybe of chastity? How would you define chastity? Uh, I, just the integration of good Christian spirituality with our focused gift giving, our creative, constructive uh, ways of, of offering ourselves so that we're not alone and other people are not alone as a result of our gift. And I think this applies as much to singles as to marrieds. Obviously, marrieds have the gift of, of giving their whole bodies to seal uh, the, that exclusive gift giving, but we express our sexuality in, in all of our relationships to some degree because we're always a gendered gift. I'm always a gift in my masculinity. I can't divorce that from my offering in service, in friendship, uh, in, in all manner of relationship. How do you help people understand you know, the, this integration, this clear vision of chastity in a culture that is really uh, moving in the opposite direction, saying, yes. look, no, you need to 
identify what you feel and what you feel is what you are. Yes. And, and uh, instead of receiving an identity yeah. and living in that received identity, male, yeah. female, the way God made us. Yes. I mean, how does that sell today in terms of people who are coming? I mean, it certainly has touched your life, but yeah. it's a different situation now than it was 30 years ago or yes, whatever when certainly. you were coming into the whole understanding yes. of it yourself. Yes, certainly. Um, I think a couple of things about that. I mean, now we're in kind of a faddish reality. It's a kind of gender identity um, explosion where there's so many identities now it's taken on um, almost a faddish quality, like I'm going to be this, or I'm not going to land anywhere, or my freedom lies in sort of transcending gender or the category you'd put me in. That all sounds very free and sort of post-university cool, you know? Yeah. But actually, I think it's, um, it renders people homeless. Like, I, I think there is something built into us where I, I actually do need to land and in making peace with my manhood or womanhood, that's a fairly obvious reality. So I, I don't think our freedom to assume all these other identities based on feelings or being discordant with being a woman or a man, I don't think that that actually satisfies our heart. So my, my experience is that when you start getting clear and yet with compassion, helping people to realize there's only two natures, and that's male and female, and there are many ways in a fallen world where we become frustrated in integrating the gift that we are. I think that resonates more with people than actually I'm a man today, or but maybe next year I'm going to be a woman, or maybe the year after I'm going to be both, and you can call me they. I think it reaches a point of a kind of moral lunacy where people just say that, uh, I think we've taken that a little too far. At which point, the answers that we have, which are simple and merciful and based on God's vision for us, become a kind of a gift and a rest from, from what is actually fracturing to our personhood. So um, that, that may not bode well or be an immediate answer for someone who is, you know, kind of out on a limb with the gender identification stuff. But um, I think we can still hold fast to the truth and hold it out mercifully.